It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Who is excited to be here? Come on. And give some praise to Jesus. God is so wonderful. He is so, so good to us. He's so worthy of our praise. Is he not? Is it so good to see you this morning, Freedom Family, to those who are joining us online, welcome. We love you. We invite you to share uh, this service with others as well. Uh, we are a two-campus church that is one. Amen? We have our north campus right in the city of Lockport from which I just came. And man, I'm telling you, we were loving on some Jesus this morning. And what a powerful service we had over there. And then, of course, we've got our south campus here and God's moving. So buckle up, church, because we've got a lot ahead of us. And I'd like to share a little bit more about that with you next week. It's called Vision Sunday. So you are going to want to be here for what is all going on. God has given us quite, quite some vision uh, to move into the years ahead of us. And uh, we're very excited about that. So we're going to unpack that next week. You're going to not want to miss next Sunday. But right now, let's turn our attention to the Word of God, the reading of God's Word. We're in the second week of our three-part, uh, our three-week series called Go Get It. Look at somebody say, Go Get It. All right, let's go get it. Let's get into God's Word. And we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, starting in verse 1. It says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you. This is no just like a recommendation. He's urging us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Did you get that, church? You have been called by God himself. He says, I urge you to walk in that call of which you've been called with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirits in the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul the Apostle, he's writing to the church at Ephesus from his Roman imprisonment. You see, he had a, a, a lot of love for this church, and he actually had spent some time in some different prisons. All right, But he, he, he kind of went through his missionary journeys all around the Mediterranean. Uh, he initially came to this place called Ephesus, and he, he was a part of starting a church there. He saw great growth in the church, and then not long later, later on, a few years later, he would come back, and he'd spend about two years with the Ephesians, teaching them the ways and the instructions of Christ even more. So he had a lot of love for them. He, he spent a lot of time pouring into them. Now, this letter that's written to the Ephesians, it wasn't written in response to a problem or to a crisis where you notice that is kind of the case in other letters that he writes to some of the different churches in the New Testament. You see, there was no heresy, no scandals that were taking place in this church. Okay, so the church essentially was pretty healthy. It was mature in their faith. So the reason Paul was writing to the Ephesians here was to help them with the core tenets of the faith. Why they believe what they believe. He wanted to really lay that out because he found that you know, sometimes people are a part of something, but they don't fully know why they believe what they believe. And so he addresses the truths of the Christian gospel in the first three chapters, and then in the final chapters, he gets practical. We just read out of the final, the start of the final three chapters. So that's what he says, therefore. Right? So the truth that he first writes about make, makes, makes possible the lifestyle and the actions of the last three chapters. So when Paul writes that, therefore, he's saying, I've just explained the core tenets of the faith. Now live your life from those. In other words, we're not to live up to the standards of the gospel, but we're to live out of the power of the gospel. And that's a difference between the two. We're not... We're not trying to work our way up to a standard. No, Jesus has done so much, and from the power of God in our lives, 
from what he has deposited within us, we now get to live out of that place. And so our focus isn't on the law or a standard. The focus is on Christ. And because of that, what starts to happen, he starts to work those things out in our lives. Doesn't mean he doesn't have righteousness or standards. Absolutely does. But guess what? We can, we can hit those things so much better with him helping us than us trying to do it ourselves. See, Paul is therefore laying out his expectations for the Ephesian church too. Okay? Because of all that Jesus did on the cross, rescuing the, us from sin, making us alive when we're dead in our transgressions, breaking down the barriers of prejudice towards one another. That's, that's all, all these amazing things that the gospel did. He just wrote about them. The list could go on, but because of all this and the power Jesus gives us by his Holy Spirit, we are to walk worthy of that calling. That means there's a new frequency in our lives that the gospel is broadcasted into our spiritual antennas. We come alive in Christ, and now we are spiritually powered on to receive the truths of God. Who's thankful for that? I'm glad that God turned me, turned me, turned the power on in my life. But that doesn't mean that we're constantly dialed into the right channel. Doesn't mean that that now that 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 we we don't go through different different places or different zones that now we're we're buffering in life. You know what I'm saying? Who hates it when their phone's buffering? You want to throw that thing against the wall because we're used to instant access right now, right? When I was younger, my parents, they would, they would, um, they would bring me out along with the church um, uh, to some, some pro-life marches. Uh, we weren't how the news necessarily portrays pro-life people, by the way, crazy and shouting at people that disagree. We actually just stood and, and we prayed for people. We were trying to be very compassionate to, to any in, in, in that realm of their life, making decisions and all of that, and wanted to point them to Christ. Uh, we, would, we would simply pray. And see, my parents taught me that if you don't stand for something, that you'll fall for anything. And I believe in the sacredness of, of the beauty of human life that was created by God himself, not out of some primordial soup mixture where somehow life sprung out of. Everything else in the cosmos and the world needs a creator, but the most complex life structures apparently don't. All right, I'm off my soapbox. The scriptures teach us that, that we're made in the image of God and that God knew us even before we were in our mother's womb. So technically mean, mean, that means that life starts even before conception. It starts in the mind of God. As a kid, though, I, I, was, I, was, I was fine going, standing up for that belief and all of that kind of stuff because we all, you know, that we we're afforded that, that in, our, in our nation to be able to stand up for things and all that. But a handful of times it would happen on a Sunday after church during football season. Who the heck planned that? <laughs> so I, I wouldn't be able to watch the Bills. And that was quite the dilemma for my, 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 my young self. So I, I, I asked permission if I could bring my little cream-colored, battery-operated radio so I could listen to the game. I don't know how much praying I did when the Bills were playing, okay? I'm just being honest. But sometimes, even though I thought I'd... I'd if you... If you know what I'm saying, you know, now you just press the buttons and it goes to every little, little part of the radio, right? Uh, it, you know, back then you actually had to turn the, the dial. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm aging myself and you kids don't know what the heck I'm talking about, all right? But you, that's what happened. Yes, there was a dial that you didn't, you didn't push, you had to turn it. And it was quite the art because you had to turn it to the right spot and it would be weird because it, it, you know, it would appear that sometimes you, you'd want it on the sports channel at like 9.30, and, but it would look more like it's on 10.50. Don't know how that worked, but you know, it would be different every time, but you had to dial it in, right? And, and I, I'd get some of the game, and we'd be standing there and we'd listen to the game, and then, then this would happen too. Just all out of the blue, it would just, just start getting fuzzy. It's like, what happened? You know, what's going on with the airwaves here, right? And, and so, so that, that, that just, that would happen. And, and sometimes the frequencies in our lives get fuzzy. And that can be the same with our Christian walks. Here's what I want to communicate this morning. If your frequency is off, then your fellowship gets fuzzy. You see, your fellowship, your connection with God, 
your connection to the brothers and sisters of Christ, who you're, you're, you're with, the frequency at which your life is set is absolutely necessary for the follower of Jesus. Because if you're not tapped into the right frequency, you're not communicating the right message. And I, what I want to tell you this morning is that your life, your life is a message unto the world today. You have to dial yourself in so that the glory of God shines through your life and breaks through the airwaves of this world. God's called you to be a message. And Paul is telling us here that in order to be that message, in order to step into that call, you've got to walk worthy of it on your lives. That means it's important. It's valuable. It's not whatever. It's not when it's convenient. It's what the gospel has afforded your future. Paul is saying this. Only the gospel establishes true calling. Because of this, walk worthy of it. There's a lot of other things out there to find yourself and all that kind of stuff, but it's really only the gospel of Jesus Christ that will establish the true call of God on your life of which you were created for, my friend. And not only that, but the good news of Christ, his salvation, his grace, and the power of his Holy Spirit that establishes the purposes and significances of God upon your life. Guess what? He wants you dialed into all of that. Calling is not your vocation. It's not what you decide for your life. Calling is not your ambition. It's not a mere profession of faith or even the faith that you practice. Calling is an invitation or a summoning by the creator of your life to follow him into an eternal frequency that tr transmits his grace through you to the world around you. God calls you to be the person he created you to be, not who somebody else is trying to make you be or even yourself. And guess what? Dialing into that frequency, walking in that call, it doesn't just happen. It's not just automatic in our lives. You have to walk into it. Take Peter, for instance. He was Jesus' biggest fan. He was always by Jesus' side. Always trying to impress Jesus. Always trying to prove himself. I mean, that's what he did. He was just like Jesus, like God, just, just always trying to put, put himself in, in, in that place. But guess what? He, he failed. He failed miserably. Jesus told him that he'd fail. Peter, Peter vehemently disagreed with Jesus. But then he failed. Three times, actually. Before a rooster crowed, Peter denied Jesus. Maybe you know the story. And with that denial of Jesus, Peter denied all that Jesus actually had placed on his life as well. All that he was establishing in him. All that Jesus had invited him to. And so you can imagine in Peter's grief of realizing that he failed and that he grieved the heart of God. You can imagine that he disqualified himself. But yet in Jesus' mercy, he invited Peter back, didn't he? But Peter had to respond still. He still had to dial himself in to the invitation of God on his life. That happened on the shores of Galilee, post-resurrection. Peter was out doing what he was doing. He was fishing. And Jesus on the shore, he didn't know it was Jesus, said, hey, throw your net down there and, and, and you'll catch some fish. And he did so and all of that. And for the second time in his life, Peter caught a massive catch of fish. And this made Peter realize Jesus was on the shore summoning him. And that invitation, it went like this. And it's found in John 21, starting in verse 15. It says, when they had finished breakfast, because Jesus laid out a breakfast for them as well. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Let's just pause there for a second. Peter's response, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I think Peter matured a little bit in his faith. I think he got a little humble, actually, because he knew that he just failed. He messed up, and something transpired in his life. And know what he didn't say to Jesus? He said, yeah, Lord, you know that I love you way more than these other guys. See, before the cross, before Peter failed, that's what he would have said. He would have said, oh yeah, I, I love you way more 
than all these other guys over here. Because Peter was always trying to establish himself as first. Jesus was testing him. And Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And then a second time, said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter responded, yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. And then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. See, Peter went back to what he was doing prior. He was fishing. He went back to what he did before. Sometimes in life there are things that get us off track with the life that Jesus calls us to. Sometimes we get disconcerted with our faith, with our walks. And with God, we get to that place where we start asking questions about why. Why are we following Jesus? Is it really worth it? Sometimes it seems as if those that, that aren't really following him and his ways are better off. So why am I even following you, Jesus, in the first place? We get disconcerted with how things are. And we go back to our old practices of fishing. Or what's comfortable to us. Or what's familiar. Or what's easy. Because it's hard, really, to follow Jesus into this invitation that he gives to us. It's not easy. So Peter was disconcerted and he was confused about his faith. It wasn't strong enough in the day of adversity. Not only that, were these last three years an entire waste of my life? I'm sure we're spiraling around the thoughts in Peter's mind. But here's the deal. Nothing is ever wasted with God. No season, no prayer, no act of service. Nothing is wasted for God. He eats everything that's put on his place, and he uses that to steer your life closer to his heart. Nothing is wasted with God. That's what he's doing with Peter here. Three times Peter denied him. Three times Jesus asked, do you love me? And those three times Jesus invited Peter to walk in a manner that was worthy of his calling. That was to shepherd the people that Jesus it's creating to be. That's what Peter call, Peter's call was. That might not be your call. The thing about Jesus, though, is that he's so personal that he has a specific call for each and every one of our lives. You're to walk worthy of the call of God on your life. A lady, Rebecca McLaughlin, wrote, wrote about a moment in 2018 when, where ISIS victim Nadia Murad shared the Nobel Peace Prize with a Congolese physician, Dennis Mukwege, a.k.a. Dr. Miracle. You see, this man was a surgeon who pioneered treatment for thousands of victims of sexual violence and brutality, especially those who had walked through uh, the times of, of war. He, called, he calls men out to be those who stand up against such atrocities. Again, you got to stand for something or you fall for anything. To stand for those, 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 those people that are broken. The fatherless. To stand up for those who have been trafficked. Stand up for those who are being convinced that they were born with the wrong gender. Stand up for righteousness in the land again. Rather than complain about everything, do something. Stand. We're called to stand in this day. Dr. Mukwege understood Jesus' unyielding call on Christians to serve the brokenness of this world. And he urged his brothers and sisters in the faith. And he says this, as long as our faith is defined by theory and not connected to practical realities, we shall not be able to fulfill the mission entrusted to us by Christ. If we're Christ, then we have no choice then to be alongside the weak, the wounded, the refugee, the suffering, those that go through discrimination, those that don't have a voice. The list could go on and on and on. Jesus calls us to reach out to the least of these. And that's what he's saying. This is my call. This is what God has called me to do. And he urges others to do the same. Jesus invites us into a call that goes well beyond serving ourselves and our own bank accounts. He was calling Peter to serve the church, his movement, his body. 
Sometimes it's not being disconcerted that takes us from walking out our calling. It's actually distraction. We're so distracted. We're distracted by money, by media, by our jobs, by fantasy football. Come on, somebody. Right? That next series on Netflix, that new app, and then we say things like, I don't really have time to answer the call of God upon my life because it's full. I don't have time to pursue this call. Can I tell you what I've learned? I've learned that most of the time it's not bad things that distract us from walking worthy of the call of God upon your life. It's actually good things. Sometimes that podcast or that message that you listen to might be a distraction. Oh, sure, it's good and spiritual. But if it keeps you from actually connecting with the heart of God by scratching the knowledge itch, or if it hinders you from hearing God personally because it's easier to hear from somebody else, then it's a distraction. If you're just going to it for spiritual information, but yet there's no spiritual transformation, then it's a distraction. Good things can distract. Paul writes about some distractions. He, he said that, that, hey, marriage is a great thing, but it's possible that it's going to distract you from God. I'm just making the point. I'm not saying marriage is a bad thing. I actually really enjoy marriage. <laughs> I have some words for Paul, all right. But, but I'm just saying there's things can, that can distract us from our lives, and even good things. In an interview with the Rolling Stone, Bob Dylan was asked about the, from the interviewer about one of his answers. The interviewer mentioned, Bob, you've described what you do not as a career but a calling. Dylan's response was, everybody has a calling, don't they? Some have a high calling, some have a low calling, but everybody is called, but few are chosen. There's a lot of distraction for people, so you might not even find the real you. A lot of people don't. That's what Bob Dylan said. Now, I don't follow Bob Dylan too much or anything like that. I don't know what his beliefs are. But there are a lot of distractions, aren't there? We can live an entire life distracted from God's call. But today's not that day, right, church? Because the Word of God has told us to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And maybe it's just time for the church just to, to do what the Word of God says. Imagine that. Imagine that if we didn't try to explain everything away and just we need 17 different reasons why we're to obey what God says. Why don't we just do it and try it? Listen, calling is a passionate devotion. Or I'm sorry. No, calling is a passionate devotion imprinted on your soul by God. Etched in who you are. It comes from God, your creator. It's a part of who you are that resonates with your soul. It's an invitation to walk in all that he's designed you to be and to do. Frederick uh, Buckner is an old-time preacher. He said, the place God calls you to is the place where your deepest gladness and the world's deepest hunger meet. You can't really shake it. It's your frequency. It's when God highlights what he's already embedded into your soul and you come to life with it. Esther stepped out in courage for such a time as this. David stepped into a destiny that he, when he volunteered to fight a giant. Luke stepped into something greater than his vocation of a doctor when he said yes to Jesus and went with Paul on his missionary journeys. Walking worthy of the call moves aside the I might and replaces it with the, I must. You see, the only way you can walk out God's call in your life is if you respond to him with, I must. I got to do this. I want to do this. I, I have to do this with my life. I must fulfill what God has called me to do. I must live out this grace that moves me to mission beyond myself and leaves behind that in action in my life. I must be a part of doing what God's called me to do. Others might not understand it, but to you it's etched in your soul. Remember when Jesus, he was a 12-year-old, and he went missing? It's a parent's worst nightmare. Where the heck is my kid? A question turns to sheer panic. 
when the answer hits you in the gut, that they are nowhere to be found. So for Joseph and Mary, it was a haul back to Jerusalem, and it took three days of walking through Jerusalem, one of the most crowded times, too, during a pilgrimage, trying to find Jesus, right? And, and so, so they finally find him, and they're like, Jesus, do you know what you've just done to us, son? I mean, we have been, we've been looking, what in the world are you doing? Any parents ever ask your kids that? What in the world are you doing? Jesus' response is, he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? King James Version, I must be about my father's business. It was a must for Jesus. It wasn't about just being in the temple. It was more about communicating the message of God to the world around. He must do that. It was his must. The only way to find your must is Jesus. And the only thing that establishes your calling is his gospel. So stop living that the reason of your life is just to merely arrive safely at death. Christ calls us to something greater, something kingdom. But how? How do we walk worthy of the call? Well, Paul tells us. With all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Well, that doesn't sound too exciting to me. Here's the deal. Only the gospel establishes true character. You see, you walk worthy of God's call... Not when you get more humility in your life or you get more patience in your life. It's not about getting, it's about growing. It's not focusing on behavior modification. Your behavior is going to change when you start to really follow Jesus, absolutely, 100%. But the focus has to stop being on what you're trying to be. I'm trying to be humble. I'm trying to be gentle. No, the focus has to be on Christ. And Christ will teach you how to be that. He'll start to make you be more like that. So any of our behavior changes come out of relationship with Jesus. Not for Jesus. Not working for Jesus' approval. Jesus did not die on the cross and supply you with the life-giving power of his Holy Spirit to simply change your behavior. That's important. Don't get me wrong. He'll do that. That's absolutely a result, but he died on the cross to change your composition, to give you a new nature, not just to change the old one. And out of the gospel, out of relationship and abiding in Christ, out of walking with the Holy Spirit, you now, you now can walk in humility. You now can forbear in love. Maybe you remember this, this story. It's a story called Cookies. It's about the toad and the frog. Anybody? Sometimes I find that kids' stories pack powerful punches. The toad, he bakes some delicious cookies, so delicious that he had to share them with his friend Frog. So off he went to Frog's house and he gave him a cookie, so this is delicious, you need to try it. And Frog absolutely loved it and soon they found out that they, they couldn't put the cookies down. So they ate one after another, they just kept pounding the cookies. Sounds like me in this story, right? But Frog soon after realized how, how, how much they were eating and suggested that Toad, to Toad that they stop eating the cookies or they're going to get sick. And Toad agreed. But the temptation for more delicious cookies was, was still there. And they ended up eating one last cookie several times. <laughs> Frog said to Toad, we, we need willpower to stop eating these cookies. Willpower? What's that? Asked Toad. Willpower is trying hard not to do something that you really want to do, said Frog. Like trying not to eat these cookies? Exactly, said Frog. But we can still open the box up even if we close it. True, said Frog, so let's tie it shut. Now we will not eat any more cookies. Oh, I don't know, Frog. Uh, we can still cut the, the string off and still open up the box. Right again, said Frog. So Frog climbed the ladder took the box and put it up on a high shelf. Said, now we will not eat 
any more cookies. Toad said, well, <laughs> frog, I mean, we could, we could still get up the ladder, still get the box, untie it, and, and, and get into those cookies. So frog, he climbed the ladder, cut the string, opened the box, threw all the cookies out the window, yelled for his friends, the birds, and said, birds, come get some cookies. And as soon as they came, they were all gone. And frog, frog said, we now have no more cookies to eat. Toad replied, and with it, we have lots of willpower. Frog said, we sure do. Now I'm going to go home and make a cake. <laughs> you see, that's a lot like us. We try and we try and we try with our willpower to change our behavior, but it doesn't actually work. Because we're, we're doing that. We're exerting ourselves. We're not, we're not dialed into the right frequency so we get the spiritual power from God. No, we first come to Christ who changes our nature and then from his work and his ability, we live from him and he changes our response in life and he begins to mature us. So we apply Christ in our lives and soon we'll walk with that humility. Humility is a position where you are not standing on your own merits. I don't have to stay. Listen, the gospel tells me I don't have to stand on my own merits anymore, on all that I've done, on all my achievements. I can stand on what Jesus has done. That's what humility is. It's not me working at being humble. That actually often comes off as false humility. And you could smell that a mile away. Rather, it's me applying Christ rather than my own positions or achievements and he does a work in my life and through my life. It's not living out of that place of where I need approval and saying, look what I've done. And now I deserve your attention and acceptance and approval, God. I, I, no, we have all that already in Christ. He is our source. Walking worthy of the call is not just in humility, it's also in gentleness. Which gentleness is an attitude where you are not demanding your own perceived personal rights. It's not about me according to the gospel. I can actually now lose my life so that I can find my real life in Jesus. It's not about my own rights and what I demand and what I think. It's about what Jesus thinks. It's about taking the place of a servant in that way. That's what gentleness is all about. It's not weakness. It's not at all. It's strength that's controlled and responds to relationship in a way that can minister God's grace to whoever and wherever I'm at. That's what it is. Gentleness is a strong hand with a soft touch. It's the ability to speak truth or to act righteously in a way that others can receive it. It's not acting with a uh, resentment or demanding our own way. It's not harshness, but it's graceful tact and concern for, for another person. Walking worthy of the call is also walking in patience. Patience is choosing to forbear offense. Every day we have more and more chances to be offended. I know I do. Uh, with the world that we live in, I have to fight the temptation to be offended daily. Breaking down the word patience, you'll find two words that make this up. The first word is long. And the second word is temper. It's being long-tempered opposed to short-tempered. That's what patience is. I mean, you can hold your temper for a long time. That's what true patience is. You have staying power. You can stick around with somebody for a long time, even if their life or their actions are hurting you or offending you. That's a miracle of God. Walking worthy of the call is walking in a way where you rely on Christ within you to help you to bear with others in love. Well, what's that exactly? Well, bearing in love is giving deference to others in a spirit of genuine care. The word in the Greek to bear literally means to take responsibility for again and again. Now, what it is not, it is not entitlement and it's not tolerance. The idea is to be continually and patiently enduring with others. Sometimes it also results, sometimes love is, is sharing a hard truth 
Not in a mean way, but sharing it in a way that, that is, is, is helpful and it can help people challenge them a little bit from where they're at. Because not everything is easy. Listen, you can't do any of these things in relationship without the working of God in your life. Notice that these character qualities that Paul mentions here are expressed and forged in the context of not individual effort, but in relational connection. You can't have humility and gentleness and patience if you're not around people. It doesn't work that way. You need people in your life for these to develop. And a third of you are like, oh, man, really? <laughs> you and I, though, we have to take responsibility for the grace of the gospel in our lives to walk these things out, not in our own willpower, but in his power. And notice that Paul says to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I want us to understand this. The unity of the Spirit comes from God. It's an established spiritual reality. Because Jesus died on the cross and calls people to be a part of this thing called the church, he established spiritual unity. It's a reality. It's a fact. But we can mess it up. We can mess it up. Real good. Listen, the unity of the Spirit, it comes from God and all that, but we can cause strife by the words that we say. We can divide by talking about others behind their back rather to them personally and individually. We can divide by shutting people out and returning evil with evil or misunderstanding with evil. We can divide by being so critical of everything that you suck the life out of relationship. We can divide by being so self-centered that you're not really, you're not really others conscious. We can divide by our prejudices and our prideful judgments. We can divide by being a thorn in the side of those who are leading and sabotaging any forward movement for the sake of, of, of what's comfy and easy. We can divide by, by not doing our part in fulfilling our role in the body of Christ. There's a lot of reasons we can divide. We can divide by putting up walls to relationship. But the church is called not to be a place to sit in. It's called to be the body of Christ here on the earth. It's Jesus' expression and his strength to accomplish what needs to be accomplished in the world around us. We are a body. The Bible says, he says this in a few verses later, we are a body that's joined and held together in, with every joint supplying and is equipping. When each part is working properly, making sure that the body grows so that it builds itself up in love. When the church lives in the unity of the Spirit, not the unanimity of the Spirit or the uniformity of the Spirit, but the unity of the Spirit, what happens? There's a bond of peace. The church grows and builds and expresses the love of Christ to the world around us. I'm just going to be honest. I try to be every Sunday. The, the church... And not just our church, the, the big C church. We, we seem to think we're more spiritual when we're more critical. And I just want you to know <laughs> that ain't true. You're far from spiritual. When you take a place of prideful judgment and what's coming out of your life and your mouth is all criticism. There's a unity of the spirit. Why can't we protect that in the bond of peace? There's ways to actually do that. Christ calls us to. There's really good ways to get through conflict. But we often choose me over Jesus. How I want to do it. There's really good ways to build others up rather than tear others down. But we usually elevate ourselves up 
And we judge our spirituality on the basis of others' lower spirituality, at least in our minds. Listen, we're not more spiritual when we're more critical. We have to be a voice and a message in the world of both grace and truth. Not one or the other. Jesus came with grace and truth. He was full of it. They're, they're, not, they're, they're, actually, they're not mutually exclusive to one another. They actually, they work symbiotically together very well. And Jesus demonstrated that. We have to be a church that loves in that way. And, 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 and not a church that, that just allows the drama and the, the, the attitude and the junk to take over rather than the love. A love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. A love that never fails. Because when we live out of the gospel, not up to the standard, there's a harmony that actually starts to take place in a, in a local church. We live out of that gospel message, that harmony takes place. And, and really, the, the only way that I can kind of show it to you or express it to you is in this video that I want to show you right here. Just give me a couple minutes and then we'll, we'll close things out. It, it, but, but check this out. It's, it's an amazing picture, in my opinion, of what the church of God can look like. Freeze. Well, Welcome to Fox Weather. Sorry, no, that was supposed to be taken off actually. Um, have you ever seen one of those in real life? Words can't quite describe how amazing those are. It's called a murmuration. And all of these starlings flying together and just there, there's mystery that's kind of about it, but it's like this life force together. Many, many individual starlings harmon harmoniously flying together, creating pictures and patterns, not only for their own safety, but it seems like for our awe. God in his nature never ceased to wow me. A picture of thousands of individuals just flying together in a cooperative unity for greater purpose. It's really a picture of the church. Max Lucado said in, 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 in 1996 now, at the Promise Keepers Conference, actually, I was just a young, young, young guy, actually went to that. But the great sin of our era is not the immorality of society, but the disunity of the church. The sin of disunity has caused more souls to be lost than all other sins. Whoa. Listen, we can fly, cannot fly in unity if we are not walking in the right frequency, if we're not walking worthy of that call, if we're not walking out the gospel, a life that's tuning itself into the heartbeat of God. Because number three, only the gospel establishes true community. 
The only way community can fly in harmony with one another, side by side, helping one another out, protecting, protecting each other from the enemy. The only way that we can do that, the only way we can do that is to protect the unity of the Spirit. The only way to fly with the mission together for eternal purposes that go well beyond our individual ambitions but extend the kingdom of Jesus Christ on this earth before his return, if we're going to be and do all that God is calling us to do, then we have to have a common intentionality. We're called to be intentional about the lives of our brothers and sisters. We're called to spend time together. Just a couple minutes, we're going to release you all and you can check out all the many life groups that are out there. That you can be a part of because it's not about just coming to a church on Sunday. It's about living life spiritually together as well. It's an opportunity to be t- attentional. But also, Paul draws us and calls us to something else. Because the gospel also affords us a common creed as well. Not American, not by race, not Democrat, not Republican, not homeschool family, public school family, not blue collar, white collar. These are not where the gospel's creeds are found. We have one body, one spirit, one hope that belongs to this call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God the Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's the creed that God calls us to in Christ. We should come together and participate on mission together based on who Jesus is. Not be separated by all our differences. That's the power of the gospel. That there is great diversity in unity. This gospel unity was given so that we could also have a common purpose. That the frequency of our lives together are harmonizing together to, to fighting, fighting the airspace around us. That we are, we are projecting a purpose, a mission, a message to the world of who Jesus is. That's what he's called us to. And that's what a church is and that's who a church should be. That's why we gather and that's why we go. So that our lives are not just a bunch of static to the world around us. Because we're living with our purposes over God's. They're not just a bunch of commercials on a radio show. That you hear more commercials than the actual radio. But that we can give beyond. We can give the gospel, live the gospel, and do this together. That's what Christ calls us to. There is a grace that's on your life to walk into that. It says that in verse 7. That he's given each one of us a grace. In our lives. And so today, we got to go get it. We go get that call, that frequency, that grace, that unity that He calls us to. I believe that God is dialing us in, dialing us into His frequency so that we can project His message to the world around. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this time. And God, we ask that you'd help us, sensitize us, help us to dial into the frequency of you in our lives, oh God, that we would walk worthy of the call upon our lives. Lord Jesus, that through the gospel, God, you'd help us to grow in the character of Christ. And God, that we would walk side by side, hand in hand, in community with one another. God, I ask that you'd work in our lives Work in our lives, Lord Jesus, so that we are dialed into you. So we just simply surrender, surrender these hearts to you today. Move us, God. Move us by the only way that you can, how you do it. Sensitize us to you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.